Welcome to another episode of Eric's Perspective. Uh, joining me today is Pamela Brown, AAA certified uh, member of the Appraisers Association, actually also a member of the board, and a friend and colleague. Pamela, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, so happy to be here with you today, Eric. Uh, thank you. So we've got all these requests um, to talk about appraising, and uh, that's actually the primary subject of today's uh, talk. Uh, but before we get into it, I just thought maybe as a way of introducing you to the audience, uh, you could tell us a little bit about yourself. So, for example, where, where were you born and raised? Um, I was born in Wilmington, uh, Delaware, and and that's where I was raised. Uh, but then we lived uh, in some other places. We moved to Chicago for a few years. So uh, I went to high school there for about a year, but then we moved back. Uh, to the area of Wilmington. So I ended up graduating uh, from West Catholic uh, in Philadelphia. Oh, so, okay. But my, home is, uh, my original home is Wilmington, Delaware. I see. And we should probably point out that I'm in Southern California, but uh, you're joining us via Zoom in Pennsylvania, right? That's right. That's right. Okay. And I went to school at the University of Delaware. Mm -hmm. And that's where I graduated. And and I know we'll, we'll, we're going to talk about some other parts of my background, but really that's where my interest, you know, started, you know, in terms of just history and research and, and especially when it comes to the research in, in our culture, African-American culture. Um, I had a, a part-time uh, job when I was in school there. And so I was doing, I was creating these slides for history class and I found out all these African Americans that I really, you know, didn't know a whole lot about, mm -hmm. and I decided that I really wanted to do something about it, and so I created a Black History game, and that was in 1973. And as a matter of fact, it's a collectible now, oh, and here goodness. it is, you know, 50 50 years later. But that's really where, uh, you know, just the whole love of of research and history and learning. Yes, it, it came about from from there and the arts, uh, and I, I it just started, you know, from there that I wanted to continue to move in that direction. So after that, uh, after the game, then you know I went to work in corporate, you know. So initially that was my background. So I was in the pharmaceutical business uh, with J and J, one of the J and J companies, uh, Janssen Pharmaceutica. Okay, um, so I did that, but always knew that. You know, I wanted to uh, really kind of expose African-American artists because at the time, you know, I didn't really see like a lot of galleries that were representing right. the artists. So I knew one day, you know, I, I would do that. And so when I left corporate, you know, I got involved with with the artists more because I was doing it part time when I was in corporate as well. Uh, OK, I want to explore that. But, but first, I'm curious about the game. Uh, what was what kind of a game uh, is it? Oh, oh, well, actually, it's um, a board game. Okay. And so the board game is called Shupel and it, it it means soul and hope. So the word so the letters are alternate letters, but that's the meaning soul and hope. Oh, okay. And it's the it's a board game, you know, for children and adults. And the whole purpose of it was to have a family type game that you could, everybody could play together. And in the meantime, you're having fun and you're learning about black history and, you know, from County Cullen to Henry Tanner to Joe Lewis and all these people that you may not, you know, a little about, right. but you get to know a lot more about. And there was, there's a booklet involved that, you know, gives you, you know, a brief history of each of these individuals and, and I did all the research. I did all the research for the game itself. That so is it totally awesome. Learning. I love it. And if somebody were interested, you mentioned earlier that it's a collectible, but does that mean that it's no longer being produced? Uh, you That's just have right. To, you have to get That's it right. It's no longer being produced, at, at, at least at this point. Uh, okay. Well, gee whiz, yeah. hopefully uh, maybe uh, it can be uh, reintroduced. <laughs> yeah. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I've had some you know inquiries about it because... Uh, something had come up and it was out of Rhode Island, a historical society. And they mentioned it like in December that they were so happy it was part of their archives. 
And uh, oh, wow. so who knows about the possibilities of the future? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. So we'll, we'll keep our uh, ear to the ground for that one. But uh, so when you were in college, were you a history major? Or how, what, what um, was I was that? a history major initially. Uh-huh. And, and then I went into political science. Uh, you had mentioned all along you were still interested in uh, African American culture in general, but also in the arts as well. How, how do how do you trace back your uh, interest in the arts in particular? Well, um, we didn't have in our home. We didn't have a lot of of art in our home, so it was really as a, as a teenager that I became really you know interested. Bought my first uh, print at the African American Museums and in Philadelphia. And so it was really getting the exposure. And then I, you know, met some people who were really into the arts. Mm -hmm. And so they started introducing me to, you know, different artists that I I really wasn't aware of. Mm -hmm. And so that's how my interest started, started out. And so then when um, I had moved to Virginia in the position in the pharmaceutical business, and then I had more exposure, you know, to new and emerging artists. And then someone said, why don't you start doing some things part time? Because, you know, in the 80s, really, the, the it was just open. Sure. Uh, and that was the time when, you know, I got to know people like Frank Frazier. And there were, you know, other new artists like in the D.C. area that, you know, I became associated with. And so I started doing some things part time. Uh, like going to fairs back then. You remember those days when you would go oh, to open absolutely, fairs? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Do I yeah. remember that was, uh, you know, and then I'm not sure what year it started, but the National Black Front Art Show in New York, for example. Uh, oh, oh you, yeah, you, well, that was much later. That was later, that right. Was, that, you know, that was much later that's with, not in with the that 80s, show. But. And as a matter of fact, um, you know, that's, we, uh, Beverly, who is the co-owner of Art Jazz Gallery, which is no longer a physical gallery, you know, we showed our work at that show. It was a fantastic show in New York. Yeah. Oh no, it absolutely. Was, I remember participating in that one too, but yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> I can't, I exactly. kind of, I kind of miss uh, doing that every uh, February, yeah. late January. That was uh, an yeah, awesome absolutely, experience. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so what happened after I uh, left the pharmaceutical industry, you know, that's when I decided that, it, that I was going to open a gallery and I did that in, in 1999. 1999. Open gallery. And by gallery, and you mean a physical space, right? A physical, a physical space in Old City, okay. uh, Philadelphia. Mm-hmm. And uh, a year later, I asked um, Beverly, who was a, a colleague with me at uh, Janssen Pharmaceutica, if she would be interested because she always was into the arts as well. Uh-huh. And so she joined me in the, in owning, in the ownership of the gallery. And... In the years between that 2002 through 2008, you know, there was a lot of fluctuations in the market, in the gallery business. It was a lot of things going on, sure. you know, at the time. And so I was also looking into the future of what would I want to do that I loved, that I had a passion for. And it still always came back to uh, the art and research mm-hmm. and learning. And so I, I I found out about appraising because at the time I didn't know, uh, you know, what exactly an appraiser did at that time. And, mm-hmm. you know, once I really found out more information about it and, you know, talked to some appraisers and I said, wow, you know, this is, you know, something that I could really, you know, get into and really love doing. And then I found out that, there were not a lot of African American appraisers, you know, as you know, across the whole country. Of course. And so I felt that that was a really good place uh, to be to be able to not only you know learn about the artists, but also allow other people to learn about African American artists and artists, you know, of color. And in the meantime, I could still, you know, have that learning aspect and. Mm-hmm love what I'm doing with the research and all of that. So that's how I became involved and, you know, went to the NYYU program at that particular time Mm -hmm. and earned the certificate in fine art and decorative arts in 2006. So it's been 17 years since I've been appraising. 
Well, that's awesome. And it seems like a perfect blend of uh, your interests and talents and so forth. The love of the arts combined with the love to research and so forth. And mm-hmm. I, I, I am a, I'm a certified appraiser as well. And I just know I like research as well. And it's like every uh, new assignment uh, is a challenge. And it's like you play detective and you delve in and learn new things each, each, each assignment, I think. Would you say the same? I, I would say the same, Eric. And, and that's really interesting because sometimes I think people don't think it's detective work, but really it is like detective work. It really is. It really is. And, but it's fun detective too. It's like when you find out something that the people didn't know about you, like so excited and you're like, oh my gosh, look at this. Yeah. You know, and, and you find out all this great information. Uh it, it's it's really a great field if you're interested uh, in learning and continual learning. It's really lifelong learning, really. Absolutely, absolutely. And that's what's exciting about it for me as well. I mean, uh, each new assignment brings a new challenge and uh, uncovers something I never realized uh, existed or knew about before. So that's uh, that's really a, a perk of, mm-hmm. of being able to do this kind of thing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And so Absolutely. what's the, uh, you still have your gallery, but not a physical space. Do you still act? It's as not a-, a physical space. And basically we do a lot of private dealing at this point, okay. you know, versus, you know, really promoting the online yes. gallery. Uh, mm-hmm. well, that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Well, okay. With all that as a, as a background, um, uh, why don't we just delve into the subject of appraising? I think uh, a lot of people might have some, some ideas about, about it. And some people probably don't even realize that it's a, it's an actual thing that might even be beneficial to them to look into. Um, so, Absolutely. so for starters, uh, what, what goes in, why would somebody want to even have an appraisal? Okay. So there are a lot of reasons why people would want to have an appraisal. Uh, they would want to have it for insurance purposes mm-hmm. uh, because if something happens to their work, then they would want to make sure that, you know, they were able to replace it yes. and replace it in a, in a timely manner. Mm-hmm. And so it means that they wouldn't have to argue with their insurance company because, you know, they would have that as a part of their policy. Yes. And when it comes to insurance and value, retail replacement is the highest value. You know, so what I mean by that is that with retail replacement, that's going to include all the framing money that you put in the, the piece, what you paid for the piece. It, it would include possibly uh, sales tax that you pay, all of that would be included, mm-hmm. you know, so that you could replace it easily within, you know, a similar, because if you have originals, you can't, you know, replace exactly the same, but it would be similar. So it would be for insurance purposes. It could be for estate purposes oh. if they're you know, for death, but it could also be for estate planning, you know, so that your family really knows exactly what you have. Right. And they, you know, aren't discarding works that are really valuable. Mm-hmm. So you would want to know what the value of the work is. Um, it could also be for downsizing purposes. A lot of people are downsizing yes. as well. And so you want to know the value of the work because maybe you would want to resell it. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe you want to put it in auction. Maybe you want to sell it privately. Yes. So there's a lot of things that, that, but you would have to know or want to know what the value is. Uh, there's also reasons uh, like divorce. If you were uh, getting divorced, uh, there would be equitable distribution involved with that. Right. And so you would have to know the value mm-hmm. you know, of, of your work and your collection. Mm-hmm. So there's, there's a lot of different reasons. There's collateral. If you want to take a loan from a bank, then they would have to know what the value of the art yes. uh, would be. So those are some, you know, and and please, you know, add to it, Eric, but those are just, you know, some of the reasons why people would really want to have their work appraised. And other people, sometimes they just want to know what they have, period. Right. They don't necessarily want to insure it, but they want to know what they have. And so they want to have it appraised. Right. I think you covered it really well and comprehensively. I would just only add donations. So sometimes you might want to donate and take a tax deduction for what you've donated. 
And in that case, of course, uh, the institution would have to qualify as something acceptable in terms of That's making right. a donation. That's right. And the other, in addition, you know, to that, that people also, you know, need to understand that they have to have a qualified appraisal and a qualified appraiser if it's over, if it's 5,000 or over. And sometimes, and th this this really happened uh, to me, it was a, a client and she wanted to um, give, the, give a donation to a qualified organization. So what she did, uh, she decided just to go online and, <laughs> and said, oh, well, this is what, you know, it was online and it's $7,000. And so that's what I'm going to, I'm going to write it off. Uh, has seven thousand right. dollars and she submitted you know her taxes to uh -huh. the irs and uh -huh. they sent it back uh -huh. and they said uh this is seven thousand dollars and if it's over seven you have to have a qualified appraiser you know to to submit this and unfortunately uh the appraisal was under five thousand so uh, she didn't really have to have an appraiser for right. it. She just could have donated the piece and then put it on her taxes because it was under five. So, you know, sometimes people don't realize that if it's under that amount, you know, then you can, you know, write it off. Uh, and I, when I say write it off, basically, I mean, you can put it on Take your a ta taxes as a deduction. A tax deduction, exactly. So everything you were talking about, so, just so that we're clear, was relating to a a uh, donation appraisal. And, yes. and in that instance, and you said a qualified appraisal. So let's explore that a little bit too, because there's a form that needs to be filled out and signed by the appraiser if it's over 5,000. And, yes. Uh, yes. and then Absolutely. there's a certain type of value that, that as appraisers we have to use. So if you were doing an insurance appraisal, you mentioned earlier, it's retail replacement value, but in the donation, it's something different, right? Right. It's right. fair market it's value. Right, exactly. So uh, when it comes to a donation, you're talking about, and it's and it's really like a, an IRS definition as well, um, specifically, and it's in the IRS re re regulations that when you're talking about fair market value, you're you're talking about a willing buyer and a willing seller, you know, with no compulsion, you know, to sell like immediately. Right, and so they are aware you know, of, of the instance. And so usually fair market value is, 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 is really auction values. Yes. Um, and so that's what you're talking about when you're talking about donations, but their value can also be a retail value, right. you know, based on the fact that there may not be auction records for a particular artist. And so in that case, you, you can use a retail value, but normally it would be an auction value. Right. And it's not a perfect analogy, but I think sometimes it helps. What I say anyway, I don't know if you'll agree with this, but I would tell people that typically, not all the time, obviously, and it's not a perfect analogy. It's like the difference between uh, retail prices and uh, wholesale prices. To some right. degree. And, it, to some and degree. you're right. Yeah. You're absolutely right. Um, and you're also right that it's not... Uh, Every case is different. Right. You know, every case is really different. Because as you say, and, if there's no auction market, you can't, there's nothing to base it on. And so you only have to, you only can rely on the retail market to arrive at a value. In that instance, it wouldn't be a good analogy. Right. It wouldn't be a set analogy. And speaking of that, it's like, if you don't, you know, have a lot of auction records, then there's other things that appraisers do. And you know this, that we then we look at, you know, other things. We look at, you know, other artists who, you know, are painting similarly yes. or the prints are similar or and they were born in the same era. They were painting or creating at the same time. Yes. You know, so there's a lot that goes into it uh, when it when it comes to, you know, appraising work. Uh, but when it comes to, you know, having a qualified appraisal, usually that is referring to donation or charitable, non-cash charitable contributions right. that are 5000 and up. The other thing that I just want to bring out is uh, so-called USPAP qualified uh, appraisers. 
and, and maybe we can expound on that. So let me just say, first of all, that that's an acronym that stands for Uniform Standards of Professional Appraisal Practice. And as appraisers, we're supposed to keep up to date every two years. We have to, as you know, it's one of our favorite things to uh, <laughs> go through the process of uh, hearing what's been changed and what's uh, not been changed and so forth. Uh, so that's another factor, right? I mean, when it comes to an IRS appraisal, especially anything involving the IRS, they're looking at that. Yes. If you're if you're doing a non-cash charitable contribution, you you must be you it's called USPAP, USPAP compliant. Yes. Which means that you're up to date, you know, with with any uh changes. And you know, I would also say that as a if a client, you know, is hire if a person is hiring an appraiser, you know, that is a question that you want to ask them. It's not about uh, certification when it comes to use path. Right. It really is about being compliant. And and a person has to be compliant, then that means, you know, that they are up with the courses and they're current. Uh, and so that's what's really important. You want to make sure that that person is following a use path, because that is the standard, yes. you know, in, in our industry, and it is required exactly. uh, for IRS. But even outside of that, you should want somebody who is compliant because it covers, you know, ethics. It covers any changes when it comes to uh, the appraisal business. Yes. So that's something to keep in mind for folks out there is to make sure the appraiser you're um, hiring to do whatever it is that you need them to do is uh, use PAP compliant. And, Absolutely. Uh, and that's up to date. Uh, they have to again every two years uh, we have to uh, uh -huh. get retested and uh, go over what's been. Uh, changed and so forth and just remind mm -hmm. us what we should uh, always keep in mind when we're putting together these things. Um, and I had mentioned earlier that um, you're certified appraiser. I am as well. Let's, uh, let's uh, explain to everybody what that means. It's not a government body that's doing that. It's an organization in New York called the Appraisers Association of America. And it was founded in 1949. And maybe Pamela, you can uh, explain that, uh, we're allowed to put, after we're certified, we're allowed to put those three A's after our name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right? that's true. That's true. You can't put the three A's unless you're certified. Unless you're certified. And, yeah. And basically, you know, what, what that means is they don't even allow you to, you know, take the test. You have to have at least 10 years experience in the business. Uh, and you, Eric, as you know, as as a dealer, you know, you had some of that ex at, that experience. But there are people who come in to be an appraiser, and they they don't have that experience, and so they have to get a certain number of hours in in terms of appraisal work yeah, exactly. and working in the field. And then after you know a certain amount of time, then you can you can ask, or or at least you can submit to become certified in a given specialty. Yes. And the same as you are, you're certified in African American uh, art, yes. and that includes paintings and sculpture and mixed media, you know, all, all those different areas. But becoming certified, it does take time, it takes experience and knowledge, and you have to take a test. <laughs> ah, and when I took it, it's been a long time ago, but when I took it, it was like a two-parter, uh, several hours uh, each time. <laughs> right? Oh, my god! It's pretty grueling, the, right? <laughs> oh, it's pretty grueling. The test is, is pretty grueling, and <laughs> the test is an eight-hour test. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it's it's pretty involved, and it covers, you know, all these different aspects. Yes. Uh, valuations and uh, it, backgrounds and artists and it, it's really very, very comprehensive, and they, they do a, a great job at it. Absolutely. The organization. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And it's really a two parts. There's like general principles that apply to uh, all personal property and art and so forth is under the category of personal property. But then it hones in on your particular specialty, like mine is African-American yes. art. Yours is as well, right? African-American art. But also, right. is it any beyond that? Is it... Uh, um, I have experience in uh, Euro European art, but okay. it's not it's not my specialty. But okay. I you but don't. I have had uh, quite a bit of experience in that area. And you've had um, experience in art that's not just African American, but by Africans in the dis di diaspora, I should say. Yes, which yes, means tribal and tribal art, uh, not so much in contemporary African um, 
artists mm-hmm. uh, to, today, you know, the artists today. But in terms of, of tribal, yes, I've had a lot of experience in that area as well. Uh, yeah. One other thing I just wanted to explore before we leave this um, particular area of this uh, field is the uh, use of comparables. You had mentioned an earlier about how if it's an original work of art, it's a one of a kind. So how in the world are we supposed to figure out, uh, even if there are ample auction records, for example, how are we supposed to figure out whether we can derive the value of this one of a kind original? And as you, you alluded to it earlier, you kind of see if you don't see works by that particular artist, then you look for artists that are similarly situated and you look for works that are roughly the same size, subject matter, et cetera. But mm-hmm. uh, that kind of thing. So it, it, it's under the category of comparables. So maybe we can ex- right. explore that. It's almost like re- in real estate. You know, you have comparables when you're, uh, you know, trying to buy a home. There's a home that's unique, and you try to f- figure out how it compares to other ones that are similar, not exactly the same. Right. And so that's a process, and that's where the research really comes in. Mm-hmm. You know, that it can be really very complex and extensive. Uh, and sometimes you think things may be simple when you look at it, uh, but it may not be. And, you know, I'll give you an example. So what happens, okay, so you have an artist, Ramir Beard, and, and you say, oh, well, uh, this is this is going to be straightforward. It'd be easy because there's lots of auction records and all of that. Mm-hmm. But then, you know, what if you run across a piece that's in early work and it's canvas, Yes. You're not going to find a lot of canvas pieces because what you're going to find are a lot of watercolors, a lot yes. of collage, yes. and it's like hundreds of yeah. pieces of those work. Right. But it becomes more complex when you have to find something like that. So then, you know, it it involves like really intense research and, you know, looking at his peers and looking at peers like Jacob Lawrence and the style of the work exactly. and the medium of the work. Yeah. And so all of that really um, makes things more complex uh, when, when you're doing uh, comparables. But you do it because you do the research for it. And then, you know, after you do all of the analysis, you know, then you're able to support it. And so the support comes in of the rationale of why you did this. Why did you compare it to that? And to be able to explain that. Yes. And we should point out that this is all we're obligated uh, to. uh, A lot of folks want everything electronically, digitally transmitted, but we're obligated to have a printed paper hard copy of all of this. Everything you're talking about has to be detailed and written out in the report. Right. Yeah. That's right. So and so. so the the client, you know, they get a written report uh, that is signed, you know, by the appraiser. Mm-hmm. And I guess sometimes people don't understand that even if a even if a, an appraiser gave you a verbal uh, opinion, because that's what appraisals are. It's it's an opinion, a professional opinion of value. Right. You know, an appraiser is still held accountable. Sure. If you get something verbal, so as an appraiser, yes, it your opinion should be written and documented. Yes. Of whatever value you're providing to your client. Absolutely, and that's what the insurance company is going to ask for if you decided to insurance uh, insure. Excuse me, and then also that's what the IRS will be looking for if you're trying to uh, claim it as a char- charitable contribution. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, I'm just curious, just uh, my own uh, curiosity. Uh, looking back on it, are there any appraisal assignments that stand out as being particularly interesting or unusual? Oh, they're all so different. <laughs> yeah, right. That's the thing. It's hard to isolate any of them out. You know, they're they're all really, really different. Yeah. Um, you know, I had a a, a client, and uh, a lot of times people may think something's really valuable because you know they've had it for like forty years, or you know they grew up with it. It was in you know their parents' uh, home. Mm-hmm. And it, it was really kind of interesting. And, you know, the woman, you know, she was an older woman. And she said, even when she was a little girl, she, uh, uh, this piece was hanging, you know, over the mantle. And, 
after I did did the research because I wasn't familiar, you know, with with the piece. Mm-hmm. And it was it was a real challenge, but <laughs> it ended up <laughs> that it was a piece by a European artist that he had created like thousands of these pieces in the 1940s uh-huh. and 50s. And so they were all over the United States and you know, it, it looked old. The piece looked old, but uh-huh. really it was, they had done thousands of them and it was really a print. <laughs> right. You know, but that was like taking it apart and then doing some imaging, you know, on online, because you can do that to see, you know, if you can find similar images. Mm-hmm. And in, in that process, I was, you know, able to to really determine that this piece was was really a print. Mm. And she thought it was something more than that. Mm. And it wasn't. Yeah, I I had a similar situation. Uh, well, actually, not similar, actually, but it was the thing where a guy comes into my gallery. He had this uh, piece that he thought was by Horace Pippen, which there aren't that many. Oh, out there, wow. And, had okay. it, and this is many years ago. And even then, had it been a genuine Horace Pippen, it would have been worth maybe $300,000 or so. Yeah. And he kind of uh, he assumed that. And uh, you can kind of see where I'm going with this. But I, I asked him if I could take a picture, and I sent it to, uh, at that time, uh, a uh, expert who had the entire catalog resume of Horace Pippen or whatever. And they determined that it was without a doubt, uh, a fake. And I don't think that he said he got it from his dad. I don't think he had any larceny in his heart or anything like that. Right, I think right, he innocently right. had this piece, right, but right. it was very difficult for him to accept because whoever did it was smart enough to know that the canvas itself dated to the time that it would have been done. This is probably in the 1940s that it should have been done. Uh, so the canvas checked out okay in terms of its age, but there were so many other things that uh, were a red flag. Right. So sometimes you, you think you have something, and it's disappointing to discover that it's not as no. valuable as you thought it was. Well, I had a, I had a, a case where a guy came in, and he had a, a, a Romare beard in print, but he thought it, it was an original. And... I, it it was very, he was very upset because he said that he had bought it, you know, from somebody who who said they were a dealer and that it was an original. Mm. Now, what happened that whoever this person, the dealer was, they cut it, you know, they cut it and put it in a frame. And (laughs) so the guy, he didn't know about art, you know, he didn't know about art. And so I, you know, I took it apart to to show him, mm-hmm. you know, and then, you know, I had to show him, you know, from a publication that, you know, this is a reproduction uh-huh. and that it's not an original and, you know, that the original, there would be paint and texture and to explain that, yeah. um, which is why it's so important to, you know, to do your research and, you know, to trust the people also that you're dealing with, mm-hmm. you know, that they're going to be, you know, straightforward and, and honest. And he was really angry. He, yeah. I mean, he was really, really angry because he had purchased this like in, um, like in the seventies uh-huh. and he had had it, you know, all that time. And back then, you know, he was like, but I spent like a thousand dollars for this right. back then. And that was still, that was a lot of money back then. Sure. And so he was really, he was upset. He was really upset about it, but there was nothing really, you know, I could do because really the piece was, first of all, it was cut. And a lot of times people don't understand if they're new collectors, you know, if they're new to collecting that a print can be extremely valuable, you know, in terms of the dollars, but you can't cut it. You can't cut it to fit a frame right. or you can't tell the framer to, to cut it because once you cut it, it's going to take away value. Absolutely. You've altered the piece now. Yeah. You've altered the piece. So let that it. be a lesson to everybody out there. Please don't mess around or don't have anybody <laughs> else mess around with your work that you right. uh, purchased or inherited or been, uh, given as a so gift. There's lots of, there's, there's lots of stories, you know, like that, that people think they have certain things and, you know, and they don't, or, you know, they think, you know, they have, you know, even with the tribal art, they think that it's, 
you know, been around for a hundred years and, you know, or 200 years. And yes. in reality, it, it's a newer piece. Right. And, you know, they find that out and, you know, they're very disappointed about those kinds of things, but they happen in this business, which is why you go to um, an appraiser, a qualified appraiser. And it's, you know, why you want to make sure you're, you're dealing with someone who has experience in those areas. Absolutely. And if they don't have it, they have colleagues. It's like, ah. you know, if I don't know something, you know, or about an artist, like I come to you and I'm going to ask you about that artist and, you know, what has been your experience and have you, you know, done evaluations that that's also all a part of, you know, your research process. Absolutely. So we're not just looking online or in books. We're talking to colleagues. We're talking to experts. Talking so to experts, forth. talking to galleries, you know, talking to those people who have experience in selling, you know, a particular work or yes. particular artists that they represent. Yeah. You know, so it's not, you know, just, okay, you go online and you find these numbers. It, it's a lot more involved than that. Oh, no, absolutely. And I just want to say that's a common, in my own experience, that's a common issue. People coming with reproductions, thinking that they're uh, a fine art print or fine art, one of a kind original. Mm -hmm. And I can't tell you how many times that's happened. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and mm -hmm. one, one way to, to listening and viewing public that you might want to check it out is just using a magnifying glass. And uh, the old way of uh, making reproductions is a photo offset lithography. And you can see little, right. little tiny dots. Uh, that's right. Come become apparent in your, in your loop or your magnifying glass. And that's a clue. That's, right. that's a, a, a pretty definitive uh, clue that what you have is a reproduction and not, not that's an original. Right. And because that's the other thing, just to clarify, so print, the term print is a general term, but it has an artistic meaning uh, in the art world. Uh, one of a kind, uh, I mean, show, let me let me just say multiple original. I think that's the sort of oxymoron statement. That, <laughs> but the plate itself is what was created by hand by the artist, whether it's um, a lithographic plate or an etching plate or stencils in the case of a serigraph. As opposed to a photograph that's been, you know, just taken of an original piece and then just a bunch of pieces uh, printed from that photograph, whether it's uh, that's right. digital or or old that's fashioned. right. Because every time that plate is struck, then it's it's different. It's the markings are slightly different, which is why it's multiple original prints. Yes, it's it's different, you yeah. know, every time. Right. And but there's you know other you know types of prints too, just. Like you're saying, there are uh, jaclays, which basically, you know, they, the jaclays, basically jaclay means like French spray, ink spray. Yeah. Uh, and so the colors are much brighter and, and they can look, I mean, you can do that on canvas, you can do it on paper and the colors are really strong and bold, Yes. Um, but it's still a print, It you know, it's still a print yeah. uh, and it's in the high end print. But, uh, but it's still in that that category exa of print. Exactly, it's essentially a reproduction, but just nicely done. Yeah, you know? and they've yes. improved the ink so they're more archival now. And as you say, they can be applied to canvas as well as to paper. Right. Yeah. But then when you're talking about offset, it's just what you said. It it's a photograph of that, yeah. and it's printed like it's a print. Right. You know. And and typically, ironically, sometimes it comes with certificate of authenticity and a lot of things that. Give it a, a little more uh, cachet, I guess you could say. But mm -hmm. what it boils down to is still a reproduction, no matter what. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, there were some questions that I'd gotten. One of the reasons that um, I was hoping to do this, and thank you for again for participating, is because uh, there were some questions uh, sent to me uh, about um, appraising and, and collecting in general, some advice. So some of the questions are around caring for your collection. And that's a kind of a broad topic because obviously you should definitely want to get insured, get insurance for it as part of caring for it. But uh, what other advice would you offer to somebody who is, let's just say, even, not even just not new to collecting, but just as a collector anyway, to make sure they're doing? Is there any general advice you might offer? Well, uh, in terms of general uh, advice, you know, I would say that you really shouldn't have extreme uh, temperature fluctuations with your art. Yeah. 
um, you know, going from really hot to like really cold. Uh, and because that can, you know, change, uh, it can contract the canvases, it can crack the canvases, it could do a lot to that. I would say that with watercolors, you really shouldn't have have that in any close to a window uh, for sunlight. And even with any art, you really should not have any direct sunlight, you know, with with your art because it can produce some fading, yeah. you know, with that over time. I'm not talking about in a year, but, you know, if you've had it in the same spot and there's sunlight, you know, coming in directly on the piece, it can affect the piece. Absolutely. Uh, and the colors, you know, in the piece. Absolutely. Um, I think that after a certain amount of time, you know, you probably do need to have your work checked with the framer if you've had it for years, mm -hmm. you know, to make sure that there's no bugs on the inside, the back of it right. or anything for some kind of way, some kind of way they get in there, these, you know, tiny little bugs. Oh, yeah. um, and you just want to have it checked after a certain amount of years. Yes. You know, making sure, you know, that it's dusted and cared for that way. Yes. I know here in Southern California, we're in earthquake country. So uh, if the piece is framed, I always advise to avoid framing it with glass because should it fall off the wall, the glass will shatter and damage the piece uh, beneath it. So plexiglass yeah. is, a, is a, I think, an advisable option. It's lighter in weight, a little more challenging to um, maintain because you can't use Windex or some kind of glass cleaner on plexiglass, but just remember to, if you want to wipe it clean with a damp cloth, uh, water damp cloth, mm. yeah, that kind of thing. So anyway, that's something else I would throw in there. Okay. Yeah. And I also think that people, you know, if, if, you know, they have works um, that are behind glass that they, they do need to uh, consider, well, a couple of things. You know, if they're having works, you know, framed, they need to make sure that the mats are acid free. Yes. Um, and if they're if they're really high end works, they really need to use uh, conservation glass. Yes. Um, and that that also protects it from uh, some of the light effects as well. If if they're using conservation glass or museum glass, they may hear that term as well. Right. And I would really advise that that they invest in that. Yeah. Um, because that's going to add a lot of protection, you know, to their work, Absolutely. but to make sure that things are, are certainly asset free Yes, when they have works behind glass. That's so important because uh, I've seen pictures of works that have been an over time. It's not like an overnight or one year <clears> thing, but the acid in cardboard, for instance, can creep around and, you know, deteriorate the work on paper. It's kind of a disaster. So it is a good idea. Right. So generally speaking, have the a piece on paper archivally framed or museum mounted as, as, as some yes. terminology to use to remember if you're going to have something that you care about framed. And I, I would like to add that if they are storing some of their work and they're not, you know, hanging, you know, their work, mm -hmm. that if they're going to store it and say, for example, you know, they're going to bubble wrap the piece or if that piece is on canvas, mm -hmm. they really need to uh, put brown paper or paper on the front of that piece so that over time that bubble wrap, you know, doesn't stick to the piece, ah. especially with, you know, oil paintings and things like that. Sure. Um, but they do need to put another covering on it before they put the bubble wrap over it. Yes. And this is just in the event of storing it, right? Not just for, yeah, just for, yeah. Just not for right. shipping. That's just for if they, yeah. you know, decided that they didn't want to, to hang that piece currently and they wanted to store it. Yes. Another thing I would add too, by the way, you were mentioning, and it's good advice not to have uh, pieces hung so that it's affected by direct sunlight, but not, also you probably don't want to put it directly over a working fireplace or uh or heating vents uh, and that kind of thing, right? I mean, those kinds of things could be a disaster too. That uh, uh, I had a disaster with with a client. It sold a piece to a client. It was a big piece, and the client. It was actually actually this was it was a reproduction. Mm -hmm. He put it over the fireplace, uh -oh. and it was it was damaged due to moisture. Yes, and it happened like quickly. Like it happened like like within thirty days. Oh wow! And it I can totally it, though. it totally damaged the piece. Yeah. Um, however, the artist uh, replaced the piece, but 
it was over the fireplace. It was a brick. It was a brick fireplace. Right. And of course it was uh, in the city. And so this was, it was old. It was old. Uh, okay. uh, that may not happen with newer homes, but you know, this was really a, a very old home. Yeah. And it was moisture, a lot of moisture. See, that's the so thing. You make an excellent point. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. No, no, absolutely. And it's that fluctuation that you mentioned too, because when the fireplace is not in operation, it's room temperature, then all of a sudden you that's crank right. it up and now it's hot and then it goes back cool again. And uh, that's you, right. you don't want those wild swings for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Here's an interesting question that's unrelated to what we just said, but if a painting sells for an enormous amount of money at auction, does it always affect the value of my piece that's by a, the same artist? Uh, it doesn't always. Um, it doesn't always affect your, your particular piece. Right. Because that goes back to what you had mentioned earlier. There's, you know, so many things that go into why um, that particular piece uh, sold for that amount you know, at auction, mm -hmm. uh, it could have things to do with the provenance who owned the piece previously. Right. You know, you could have, you know, a situation where there's really only like two bitter bidders mm -hmm. on a particular piece yep. and they're trying to outbid each other. And you want to look at trends. So that individual, you know, that you're talking about, it could affect it. But you have to look at trends, not just one value that happened at one time. You know, one thing that comes to mind is that Ernie Barnes that sold for, what was it, $15 million, right? So does that mean everybody who has a piece, let's even say the same size and date of creation, would that their piece automatically now jump up to $15 million? Uh, Probably not, right? Because that's uh, probably not very, very unusual. <laughs> probably you, you not. At, yeah, if you look However, at it, yeah. Um, and that that's a good example that certainly, you know, with his works, um, the value has been affected and it continues to be affected. And the reason we say to our clients that they need to have a reevaluation of their appraisals every three to five years is because there are fluctuations in the market. And maybe, you know, you spent 10000 but now that artist works or selling like for $40,000 oh, sure. may not be 15 million, but it's doubled or tripled in value. And if you had to have that replaced, you wouldn't be able to replace it. Right. So it's advisable, you know, that you do have your work appraised because you could be paying too much insurance mm -hmm. or you could be paying too little insurance and not be able to replace it. So I hope that answers the, the question that maybe it could affect the client's value with the auction. Right. But then again, it depends on other variables right. that come into play. And even in that case with the Ernie Barnes, even if it doesn't bring it up to 15 million, it could bring it up from 100,000 to maybe 500,000. You never know. It could have that kind of a pull, perhaps. Exactly. Perhaps. Exactly. Not, not as extreme, but... To at least to some degree. And no doubt, because yeah. as I mentioned, it really, you know, it's about the trends. And with that particular trend, yeah. the trend is is certainly upward. And I think that it will continue, yeah. you know, to be upward. And so, yes, one needs to, you know, investigate that and yeah. ask the appraiser, you know, for an update on the appraisal for a given work. Well, that's, that's another good point, though. I just want to highlight that, too, because... Uh, I know that most insurance companies will advise you to have your collection, no matter whether there was some spectacular event or not, to have your collection maybe reappraised two to three years, uh, right? Is that pretty much your understanding? Well, from my understanding, it's three to five. Three to five. Okay. But, Still. It's but I know that even with my, you know, clients and looking at the market, if I see work, you know, that they they've had mm -hmm. and they had an appraisal like maybe two years ago when something you know really has jumped mm -hmm. then i would contact them and let them know that they they need to have the work updated yeah. and so it could be that two-year period that you're talking about right so that's another important consideration when you're caring for your collection I would also add, by the way, it's a good idea to keep all kinds of records. I've done appraisals where people uh, 
range from keeping all their receipts and sometimes even clippings about uh, works or the artists who created the works to people that don't have a clue as to where anything is in terms of that. So if you can Absolutely. keep, keep records as, as, as much as possible to uh, help support um, the documentation of the work that you have. Right. Thanks for bringing that up because yeah. it's, it's, it's really, really important uh, to, to keep records and Sometimes, you know, there are times that maybe a gallery or, the, or you know, someone, the a dealer didn't give you the paperwork, you should ask for the paperwork mm -hmm. so that you have it documented and, you know, making sure that the measurements are on that documentation on the sales receipt and the title, you know, what the medium is. Absolutely. Uh, and when I am referring to medium, I'm talking about is it paper or canvas or mixed media, et cetera. Yes. And to make sure that that's all documented, you know, when you get that information from the people that you purchase it from. Absolutely. And I just want to define a term that many people probably already know the definition of, but maybe some don't, uh, provenance and uh, the importance of that. So provenance is just the history of the ownership. And sometimes that could be key to discovering whether the piece that you have is fault, fake or not, or stolen or whatever. Right. Right. And that's why, as you mentioned about record keeping is, is really important because that, that will be on your sales receipt, or if it was in the secondary market, you know, then that information is going to be documented mm -hmm. of who owned it, you know, previously. Uh, and it, the ownership has, can have an effect on value. Um, if it was, you know, a really famous person who owned the work, it can affect value, you know, on, on the higher end. Mm -hmm. I mean, so it is important. Sometimes people don't really think that is that it's important. But, you know, in the art world, uh, if it's owned by the queen or oh, yeah. it's owned by the president, Absolutely. I mean, it, it becomes a part of history and ownership and and it increases value of oh, a work. Oh, no, absolutely, absolutely. It reminds me of, I remember this is a long time ago, though, they sold um, some furniture that one time belonged to Jackie Kennedy, and uh, she's a famous person. I mean, if she didn't own it, maybe the, I'm not sure what, but it, the rocking chair would probably have been worth maybe uh, $700, but because she owned it, it was worth a lot more. So That's right. you're right, who owns it could actually impact the value. Right. The other thing, too, is, uh, as you're saying here, uh, now that we're in the digital age, it's easy to take a picture of the piece and of the receipt to create a file, even on your phone. So that just goes to record keeping, though. Uh, and just to add to that, uh, the receipts and everything, if you do have a picture, that would be great. Uh, take a picture of it uh, and uh, keep that in the file as well. Oh, I, I agree. Yeah. I agree, 100%. I think we've covered all their questions. Can you think of anything else that uh, you would offer as advice for anybody uh, that is uh, considering collecting or already collecting? I thought maybe we could talk about some of the, a couple myths. Oh, yeah. Have. Oh, no, let's do it, please. <laughs> let's get that out of there. <laughs> so, okay, so I, this is a couple myths that, that uh, I wanted wanted to share. And that is a lot of people think that uh, art always increases in value. Yes, that is, that's a good one. <laughs> okay. So, you know, just to kind of clarify that, that it doesn't always increase in value because first of all, there's a lot of variables that go into that. And it depends on the artist. Uh, it depends on the artist standing in the art world and community. Mm -hmm. It depends on the piece itself. Uh, it depends on even the, the desire to collect that type of work. Right. And so it fluctuates, you know, but it doesn't always increase. It can, you can have these really steep prices that, you know, 10 years ago might've been like 20,000. And then today it's like, I'm sorry, that piece is only worth like five. And that's something very hard, you know, to tell a collector, what do you mean? I spent... $20,000 for that. Right. And so it, it really is a myth that it's always, you know, going to increase in value because, you know, art goes up, it goes down, it, it stays the same. Right. And, and I think so that, people, a variation of that is when the artist dies, it automatically goes up. And that not, that's not even the case. 
Well, that, that automatically. Thank anyway. you for that because that was the other one that I was going to mention. Oh, sorry. I always hear that people will say, "Oh, well, the artist is dead now, so his prices are really <laughs> jumped up really high." No, right. no, not necessarily. Right. And it goes back to some of those factors, you know, that I named previously. But people do think that, Eric, that okay. they they believe that once the artist is dead, and you know, sometimes I just tell people that listen. You know, if an artist dies and there's no one who's going to push his work forward or represent his work or support his work by collecting his work, then it it dies with him at least for a while. Yes. Until someone decides that, oh, my gosh, this artist was really fantastic and you know, we should promote this artist, et cetera, because that's what happens. And it's like maybe 10, you know, 15 years later. And then yeah. suddenly, you know, this artist that nobody wanted, now he's become really, you know, popular. Yeah, no, absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, any other myths? Those are two of the main myths that... I hear those a lot too, by the way. I'm so glad you brought those up yeah. because that's definitely common. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you kind of understand too, because, you know, Basic economic principles, the law of supply and demand, you figure the artist dies, the supply is now cut off so that he or she can't produce anymore. So you can see the logic behind it. But as you pointed out, though, it's not automatic. So many other things have to come into play before that. Right. It's in. not automatic. It's not automatic. When somebody approaches um, you for an appraising assignment, uh, how, how do you charge for that? So... It, it depends if it's if it's a uh, institution, you know, then normally, normally I will do a project fee. So as an appraiser, you are, are paid by by the hour. Mm -hmm. uh, and one thing that uh, I think that collectors, which most collectors, if they've been collecting, they know this. But, you know, maybe someone who's who's a new collector, they may not know. That, that a, an appraiser never, never really should say, oh, well, I'll appraise it and I'll just take a percentage of the appraisal. Uh, you know, and yeah. That's an important that, point to bring out. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's you a real, could, you could see. I had someone to say, tell me that. They yeah. said, oh, but I have this appraiser and he's just going to charge a, a percentage. And I was like, no, right. that's. That's unethical. What, yeah. what you're saying is a percentage of the value that he or she arrives at. Uh, and that's exactly. definitely a huge no, no. So right, right away, if you hear that, uh, right. Seek, seek one out. So in terms of, of the fees, it's by the hour mm -hmm. and, and we'll just go back a little bit about, you know, what does the appraiser, what, you know, why are you getting paid, you know, a hundred, $50 to $1,000 an hour. And mm -hmm. so that depends on who the appraiser is, the experience the appraiser has, and they set their, their own fees per hour. Mm -hmm. And so what you do is you take a look at what the client wants to appraise, and then you determine how many hours, you know, that's going to take. Right. And you provide that estimate. So what happens, Eric, sometimes you, you know, do the estimate. However, as we mentioned earlier, it's very complex sometimes. Things that may look straightforward, you know, they become complex, you know, in the process. Right. And so you provide the estimate, but you also make sure that you're informing, you know, the client to let them know, you know, that this it's going to be, you know, additional, there's going to be an additional charge. And the other part of that is that that fee that you're paying is going to include, you know, the inspection and inspections are done, you know, physically, you know, in person, or they could be done online, mm -hmm. uh, whatever you and your client, you know, work out, but it, because that inspection is about making sure that the work is, you need to identify what the condition of the work is in, mm -hmm. identify the signature, you know, take uh, photographs of the work, you know, all of that is involved in the inspection and you documenting the size, et cetera. Yes. You know, so those fees are going to include the inspection. It's going to include the research. It's going to include market analysis and the writing of the report. Right. You know, so those are, are really the four, you know, main areas 
when it comes to what what are you paying for? And then sometimes people will look at, oh, well, that person is only going to charge me 150 and you're charging, you know, 300. I'm going to go with the 150. But what happens? Okay, it's going to take the person who's charging 150. Maybe it's going to take them, you know, 50 hours. Right. You know, whereas the the person who's charging you 250 is going to take them 10 hours. So you have to look at the number of hours and you have to look at at price too and not just look at you know one set of things you have to look at both because sometimes people just look at oh well you know that's too expensive but it may not be it may not be that's a very good point you're looking at two things you're not just looking at the hourly rate but uh, the estimate in terms of how long it's going to take a more experienced appraiser will know how to kind of get to cut to the chase so to speak and really get down to the bottom before uh, that's right. Yeah. And in a relatively good uh, uh, amount of time, for sure. That's right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And again, to reiterate, uh, you were saying write the report. So we're obligated to write a written report and keep it on uh, file for, I think, what is it, three to five years? Five, three to five years. Yeah. Well, okay. Uh, this has been, uh, I hope, uh, for everybody listening and viewing uh, a, an informative thing. And of course, um, I want to thank uh, Pamela once again for, for joining mm-hmm. us today and sharing uh, your perspective and your experience and knowledge and so forth. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. You're (laughs) welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Okay. And thank you all out there for tuning in and don't forget to subscribe. Thank you. Mm -hmm.